The internal representations of language meaning evolved partly from our pre-linguistic ancestors' knowledge of social relations. Remember, when we tell stories, or listen to stories, they're always about social relations, all the time. Like modern monkeys and apes, our ancestors lived in groups with intricate networks of relationships that were simultaneously competitive and cooperative. The demands of social life created selective pressures for just the kind of complex, abstract, conceptual, and computational abilities that are likely to have preceded the earliest forms of linguistic communication. Although baboons have concepts and acquire propositional information from other animals' vocalizations, they cannot articulate this information. They understand dominance relations and matrilineal kinship, but have no words for them. This suggests that the internal representation of many concepts, relations, and action sequences does not require language, and that language did not evolve because it was uniquely suited to representing thought. Well, you know, as I mentioned to you in, in the last class, or maybe the previous class, not only do monkeys, baboons say, which are very complex, but not only are they able to track dominance hierarchy structures without language, like lobsters are able to do it. So you can be very, you can be very, very sure that the underlying basis for the linguistic representation of social interactions is, is deep beyond belief, since we share it with crustaceans. So, and it, it's very useful to know this because it, it also helps understand why certain things have intrinsic meaning, you know, like the dominance hierarchy and the position in the dominance hierarchy and the relative status of creatures is an intrinsically meaningful piece of information to us because it's an important determinant of our survival and reproductive opportunities. So, the meaning is there. You don't have to learn it. You just have to figure out what to map it onto. And that, that means that that kind of meaning, status-related meaning, is archetypal. It's, it's built into you as, a, as, as the ground of understanding. So, and I'll, I'll show you something. Hopefully this will work. Um, the American work. There we go. Okay, so this, watch this. Watch it one more time. Okay, so anybody willing to hazard a guess about what was happening there? It was an attack. That's that's one hypothesis. Yes. Any, anyone else? Let's let's look at the players once again. Well, so the poor little pink circle is trapped, and then it's trying to get out. And when it does get out, the big gray triangle shepherds it away, but that irritates the blue triangle, which shepherds it back into the box, and the gray triangle isn't able to enter, something like that. You can tell a story about it. And does that, I don't know, like, I'm not saying that's the canonical interpretation of the triangle's behavior or any of that, but you would agree, I presume, that that's a reasonably plausible interpretation of what those triangles and circles were up to. Yes? Okay, well, no, right, because they're triangles and circles. But the point is, the point is, is that our, our ability to perceive social interactions is so deep that we can take entities that are only living insofar as they're moving in certain ways, and we immediately attribute, like, motivation to them. We can tell a little story about them, and we can also agree on the story. Now, you could say, well, it was sort of built in by the people who made the little animated demonstration, but... That, that doesn't matter, because the point is they were able to build it in with, with, with virtually no representation whatsoever and communicate it, because they, they knew that we understand that sort of information. It's a good idea. So <clears throat> there's a couple of things that are interesting about that clip. One is everything's animated, everything has a life, and that's actually okay. You can watch that and you understand it, which is quite strange because, of course, generally trees don't dance around and so forth. But, 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 but the, the, this module that we have, so to speak, it's a bad way of describing it because it's, it's more like uh, an entire mode. It's the entire mode of human perception is being called the hyperactive agency detector by people who are somewhat skeptical about its operation. But um, because we're evolved to exist within living environments, it's very living, dynamic, animal-oriented environments, it's very easy for us to see everything in that way. Everything is alive, a priori. And that's why when you're reading stories to your kids, it's like Thomas the Tank Engine has, you know, a personality and motivations, and so does the little engine that could, and all these things that, 
that, that, that are used to represent to children ways of interacting in the world. So, all right, so the, the point of all this, basically, is that we've evolved to categorize the world into social categories. And the social categories that we use, or that use us, that's, that's a more accurate way of looking at it, because these aren't tools that we voluntarily use. These are ways that we perceive the world. They're, they're underneath our understanding. They're preconditions for our understanding. So we tend to parse up the world into personified categories. And I didn't even say that properly exactly. Because that implies that you're projecting something onto the world, this personification. It's deeper than that. It's that the world appears to you naturally in a, in a, in a living and animated manner. And the reason for that is because most of what you process, and this was certainly the case in, in, to a great degree before human beings became technologically proficient because we weren't that good at manipulating the objective world at all. Everything that we thought about and everything we did essentially was dependent on other <coughs> creatures. And so what that also means is that whatever advances we've made in understanding the objective material world, we've made it by, by uh, with a tremendous amount of effort removing that tendency to see things in an animated way from our collective perception and, and, and working diligently to come to terms with the fact that there are ways of treating certain phenomena that aren't animated that work better. It's very, very difficult for us. And that's why, for example, we really didn't come up with a science-based technology until about 500 years ago. We really had to work against our own instincts. And we've still done them tremendous damage because to the degree that we now perceive the world as objective and material and sort of dead, in a sense, it's also, de it's also being deprived of meaning. And people really suffer for that. You know, because modern people can certainly say, given our understanding about the nature of reality, is it reasonable to propose that anything truly has meaning? Well, that's a very difficult question. I would say don't give up on it too, too quickly. Okay, so here's, here's some natural categories of apprehension. So there's the dominance hierarchy, that's for sure, and that's the social group. That's actually what Jung called the animus, le leaping ahead a little bit to the, to the, to the Jungian portion of, this, um, of these lectures. The, 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 the dominance hierarchy is basically what modern social constructionists call patriarchy. And it's often symbolized by an adult male. And it, that can have two aspects, positive and negative, because you know, you're the beneficiary of your culture and you're also its victim, so to speak. It preys on you and pushes on you and shapes you and molds you and takes taxes from you and fines you and doesn't let you do things. But on the other hand, here you are in this university and you're not starving to death and you can all communicate and it's pretty peaceful. So, you know, there's, there's the, the great father, so to speak, bifurcated into two elements, positive and negative. And I, I told you the other day that that was Osiris and that's who he represented for Egyptian mythology. He's sort of standing on a pillar and uh, in the representation to the right, which is kind of an odd Christian representation, you have God the Father in the middle. He's sort of encapsulated inside Mary and he's holding a figure of Christ and everyone in the, the thing opens, eh? and everyone on the doors is sort of looking at Christ. And, um, so there's the father in the middle there, and the father in the middle there, and then on this side you have what's essentially the son, S-O-N, and S-U-N at the same time, and that's Horus there, and it's Christ there. There's equivalent figures in other religious and cosmological systems. And then on the right you have Isis, and Isis is related to Mary, especially in this image, because Mary is basically portrayed there as the mother nature that incorporates culture that's holding the individual. It's a brilliant representation, both of them are. The one on the right is, is a spectacular representation because it sums up the existential situation of human beings in, in one sculpture. And that is that, well, all around us is nature, and nature gives and takes away, and nature gives rise to culture, and culture supports us, and while it supports us, we suffer, and hopefully we suffer and can manage it, and that's why everyone is gazing at the figure in the middle who's basically accepted the inevitability and necessity of his own death as a precondition for life. So it's an amazing representation, and a 